You're watching Nice Behind the Scenes, a space for conversation about community, collaboration, and the future of journalism. You know, Eric, I think it's important for us to start at the beginning. I think a lot of the people inside WHOI have heard me talk about the application process for NICE, how many people applied. And for, our, for the record, about 400 people applied for this role. Um, I'm, I've always been curious as to why you even wanted to do this from jump. And I don't think I've ever had a chance to ask you that, so I want to ask you that now. You know, that's a, that's a great question because it, is, it isn't something that would naturally, uh, instinctively fit in my wheelhouse. But I think what it was is how you guys wrote the job description, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with a slant towards community engagement, understanding mm -hmm. that, you know, this was something new and innovative that WHYY was doing. And I think the credit goes to you and Sandy being able to think outside the box and really connecting community engagement with journalism, which is something that it rarely has ever happened before. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was really the opportunity to connect with the community not so much uh, anything relating to journalism. Um, I think and to be clear, you've never had any journalism background. You were not a journalist. You never considered yourself a journalist. Never had any journalism background or training, considered that at all. I've always been a, a lover of words and storytelling. And mm -hmm. so I think I, I understand the importance of people and communities sharing their stories. Um, so, so to see this come together, it was like really, uh, I don't want to say cliche, like a dream come true, but it was just a great opportunity and a brilliant idea um, as soon as I saw it. So I so what's it been like, like being around journalists, being around the journalist lingo? I mean, how hard was it in terms of a learning curve? Oh, it's still hard. Um, <laughs> it's still hard. It's not, it's not, it's, I mean, it's getting easier, but the, one of the things that I said to you early on when I first started was that it's, Journalism is an entirely different language and a different mm -hmm. culture, right? It's, it's unique in and of itself, right? There's a certain schedule, there's a system, there's a pace that journalists operate at. And I think as anyone that's come up as a journalist or through journalism training, they understand that and mm -hmm. it's something you pick up. But the rest of the public, uh, I don't think, understands a, a, a fraction of what journalism really entails and what that mm. that culture looks like. And so for me, coming on board definitely was a steep learning curve. Uh, but again, I think that's part of the brilliance in that the nice partners um, don't come with that perspective necessarily. Some mm -hmm. of them, they come with various degrees of that understanding. And so it allowed all of us to kind of get on board and to also acclimate to our own system and culture in a way that's different than, than journalists operate. And what I found is that, you know, now some of the WHYY staff and reporters are starting to understand the nice culture. And I think it's a, a great blend between mm. uh, two different worlds. How would you describe the nice culture? What is, what is the nice culture? The nice culture is definitely first and foremost collaborative. Mm. Um, many of the partners have described it as a family. Mm -hmm. Right. That it is this it is its own newsroom in and of itself where folks who have normally operated in isolation or with the understanding that there were few, if any, people doing what they were doing um, now get a chance to be in in collaboration with other like minded individuals. And, you know, again, as I said, many of the partners describe it as a family. Um, and so it just it, it just works out really well. Yeah. I guess to back up, how do you describe nice to people who 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 have not heard of it? They see the really cool shirt you're wearing or the hoodies and they go, what is nice? Yeah, well, the long answer is, uh, you know, mutual aid journalism collaborative. But that sounds a lot like jargon when you're talking to the average <laughs> citizen. Right. It's like, well, uh -huh. what does that mean? Um, and the, re the reality is what I describe it is, you know, an opportunity for grassroots content creators individuals who create news and information to come together and form a network across the city that can help address some of their needs and challenges. Mm -hmm. And so those mm -hmm. needs and challenges vary depending on who the partner is. Uh, but by creating this network where we're all interconnected, you know, it's a way that, you know, all, all that, you know, what is it? A rising tide lifts all. Mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's interesting because it's, it's, it's a collaboration. Sometimes it feels like a mentorship. 
Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it feels like, you know, as I said before, a newsroom. Um, so there's a lot of different dynamics that come into play. Um, but I, I think, again, the way that I would describe it is definitely a, a family of content creators. Yeah. You know, journalism collaborators aren't new, right? I mean, in Philly, we have Resolve Philly. I mean, mm -hmm. throughout the country, there's there are journalism collaborators. What makes NICE really interesting and really unique is that it's, like you said, grassroots content creators. I mean, these are people who, you know, to, to some are still relatively unassuming, unknown names, but, but to a lot of people in the city are trusted, you know, information providers, neighbors, you know, thought leaders, activists, people like Conrad Benner, who you see at the Art Museum, and Purple, who you see, you know, with her camera. I, I used to see Purple covering press conferences when I was covering press conferences uh, for Techbook Online before I joined WHOY, and I didn't know who she was. I just would always go, who's the chick with the purple hair that's always in my shot? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and she and I were talking recently. She was like, I didn't think you liked me. And I was like, I didn't even know you. I just didn't, I just didn't realize you were doing what you were doing. Is it... Um, is it shocking or surprising to you to know that there's this many? I mean, we have about 11 to 12 nice partners on, 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 on the books right now. Mm -hmm. Is it shocking to you to know that there's this many people out in the community, usually by their own, uh, using their own money, creating content and not just like talking like, you know, you know, just talking any old type of stuff, but like actually providing relative and relevant news and information. It, it, was, that a, was that a shock to you? It honestly wasn't a shock to me. And I think mm. it wasn't a shock to me because, again, I come from a background of community, community engagement and community mm -hmm. organizing. And so I know that the community has within itself all of these amazing individuals and these pieces that a society requires or needs, um, just not operating, you know, in a way that the average resident or citizen would be aware of them. Right? Mm. And so they, they come with a level of professionalism. They come with a level of dedication and commitment. Many of them, as you just stated about Purple, have been doing it for many, many years, mm -hmm. but under the radar to a certain extent or to a very niche audience. And so mm -hmm. the average um, citizen, the average resident in Philadelphia may not know about some of them, but they do it out of a sense of dedication and commitment to their community and to their audience. Um, many of them work full-time jobs while mm -hmm. still carrying off, you know, pulling off their, creating their content. And so, yeah, no, it wasn't a surprise for me at all. What, what, was, what was a surprise was the range of expertise that I encountered. Mm -hmm. you know, there are some individuals like Emma Restrepo who moved to Philadelphia from Columbia, uh, mm -hmm. South America, who was already a journalist and she moved here as an adult. And so she brought all that experience and that background with her. You know, Conrad Benner, as you had mentioned earlier, had been doing his blog, Streets Department, for 10 years before we invited him and got a chance to connect with him at NICE. So many of them have been doing the work that they do uh, for uh, decades. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, again, now, you know, they've, they've just been, it's kind of, been, kind of been like an underground culture of content creators that mm. you know, mainly mass media doesn't, isn't aware of. Yeah. So let's let's get to what I think people are have tuned in for, you know, the topic of the future of journalism or, in, you know, more specifically stated, the, the, the future of journalism is people. You know, that's something that I truly believe. Uh, I think that's something I shared when you and I were on a, a recent panel, um, the Collaborative Journalism Summit. Um, as a non-journalist, someone who's still acclimating itself to journalism culture and thinking about uh, understanding how journalists think and, and act. When you hear that phrase, the future of journalism is people, what does that actually mean to you? Like, how do you interpret that? What it means to me is there's an awakening that's happening across the media landscape, right? That awakening is a realization that, honestly, I believe that journalists in general have kind of always been walking this tightrope of, you know, this Ivy League institution mm -hmm. where there's this reputation that being a journalist is somehow makes you, you know, this better human being. You're, you're <laughs> able to be objective, right? And mm -hmm. you're not in the mud. You're in it, but you're not of it, as, as the saying goes. Um, and I honestly feel like that is, has, is, a, is an attitude of elitism that actually moves away from the original need um, 
for journalists in the first place. And that again mm -hmm. goes back to this idea of sharing stories. So mm -hmm. the future of journalism is people. It, for me, it just a, is a reminder that the root of journalism is people. Mm. It's really about conveying people's stories, what's happening in, in, in communities, um, and, and what do people need to know to stay informed and to possibly improve their lives. And I think that the, the pandemic is really the root cause of uh, like uncovering all of this, mm. because by being quarantined, by being socially distanced, by uh, facing what, we've, what, what we haven't had to face in generations, uh, we realize that we need each other. And, and what that means is we need resources and we need resources that are close to us and we need to know how to access those resources. And so mm -hmm. it's the people that are closest to us that have those things, uh, give us an awareness of what, 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 how to get them. And journalism is that, right? It's pointing people in a direction of information that they need. And so, yeah, I think the future of journalism is people reminds us that we are all in this together. Yeah, I think that's the profound thing that I take away from what you said is that it's going back to its root. So really the future of journalism is going back to its root. You know, it's not even about recreating the will or yeah. pontificating deeply. It's like literally getting back to the basics of connecting with people, talking to people, building relationships with people beyond the story. I think for a lot of people, they think that, you know, Look, I, I'm speaking from my experience. I know that for some of the journalists I know, they feel that their job ends when the content hits the web. And I have always said, then that means you're in the publishing business. You're interested in publishing content to the web. If you're in the journalism business, the story begins when you publish it to the web, because now you're, you're sifting through people's reaction to it. You're determining whether you need to convene a conversation or a series of conversations to help unpack this issue, to add nuance to it. And, and to really dive into expertise. And so for me, you know, when I think about the future of journalism as people, I, I think about it as, you know, how do we center people first? How do we think about people first? How do we include people into um, every process that we possibly can? How do we even have, and I know this is a, a um, I, and this could be a controversial idea to some people and, and may not for others who are listening and watching. I even think that some of our editors meetings should be broadcast to the public and that the public should be weighing in on and typing in the chat when we say, okay, what's the story of the day? How are we thinking about framing this? Well, you know, blah, 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 from the way TMZ does. So you're you know, making it a all... democratic process by- Absolutely, mm. absolutely. And why not? Mm. I don't know everything about this city. I've lived in this city my whole life. I know a lot about it, but I don't know everything. And I definitely don't know a lot about Kensington and Allegheny. I definitely don't know a lot about 24th and Somerset. You know, I definitely don't know a lot about 3rd and Allegheny or Forefront Spring Garden, right? So why not get added insight? You know what I mean? The, uh, I, and I, again, this is going back to the summit. There's this concept called a cognitive surplus. And it sounds just like what it is. The more brain power, the more collaboration that you can bring into a space, the better off you will be, the better off a project will be. Because we're all really interesting and innovative people on our own. But when you throw all of that in, into um, a, a process and aggregate everybody's talents and ambitions, how can you go wrong? Now, again, I'm not saying every meeting needs to be public, but if we did a once a week public meeting, that's mm -hmm. almost like a town hall format and people can weigh in and help us think about the stories, you know, why not? You know, I think, I think it's a brilliant idea, I, I, but I think it also flies in the face of the business of journalism, right? Mm. I think we've gotten into this situation because news and journalism turned into a business at some point in time. And anytime you have a, a, a thing that relies on this capitalist structure of, of this, this business model that relies on audience and revenue and things like that, then you start moving away from a democratic process and you start leaning more towards, okay, well, let's, what's going to get the most readers? What's going to get the most clicks? What's yeah. going to get the most, the biggest audience? And so I think that's where the shift happened many years ago, where news and journalism- Many, many years ago. Many, many years ago. But I don't know, if, I don't know how long ago, right? I don't know if it would, if it started in the 80s or the 90s, right? But I know- you know, um, the battle probably uh, near the advent of 
Cable of, news. of cable news. Yep. I was going to say cable late eighties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I and really that, that was- exacerbated around the time of the OJ Simpson trial. And, you know, when things just became really sensational and it was like, I, we just got to, we, there, there are people out there, there are eyeballs we can get. Let's get it. Yeah. Yeah. And so because of that, I think the focus has moved away from people, right. Mm-hmm. And more about profit. And so because mm. of that audience, you know, clicks, likes, things like that, we where our society has kind of moved in that direction. And it's 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 amazing that it took a pandemic to happen to get us to start rethinking uh, this perspective. But I think you're right. If you open it up to people, that cognitive surplus can only benefit folks. Now, of course, like every democratic process, it's going to be a challenge because you're going to find people that disagree or that have totally different slants and perspectives of what they want to address or what they feel is important. But I think overall, I think it improves everyone's situation and it improves the news that you share the movie yeah. and the content that you share. Well, I think we need disagreement. I think we should be fostering disagreement too. Like, you know, I'm one of those people who have friends and people I disagree with about most things because it keeps me sharp and it challenges me. And I don't want to ever be in an echo chamber where I think I only want, you know, a log on Facebook and have my Facebook feed reinforce the things that I already think about. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. But to, to the other thing that you're talking about in terms of people over profit, I think the way that journalism works as an industry also kind of dehumanizes the audience because they, they talk about it in the context of we're trying to get eyeballs mm-hmm. and clicks. We're not trying to win over hearts and minds. Yeah. We're not trying to change minds. We're not trying to build relationships and connect people through content. We're trying to get eyeballs. Yeah. We're trying to get your attention for as long as we can to stay on this website so we can measure how much attention we're getting, how much traffic we're getting, and then we can sell those measurements to advertisers. Yeah. And, and, and that is the model. And that's not to say that it's wrong because it's that model that has us working today, but that doesn't mean that we can't um, augment it and bring a balance to it so that we are funding really important journalism, but we're not losing focus of what journalism is supposed to be about. I'm going to say it is wrong. I I say it absolutely is wrong because, again, if the goal is just eyeballs and how long people will stay on a site, well, then now you're just you're you're asking for zombies, right? You're just asking Mm. for people who are mindlessly consuming your content. It goes Mm. back to what you were saying earlier about journalism doesn't start until after you publish it, because then that's when the the conversation starts. Mm -hmm. Right. So Mm -hmm. are we eliciting conversation? Are we stimulating thought or are we just warehousing people and like capturing their minds and their and their eyeballs mm-hmm. in order to measure, use an algorithm to measure how long they're on our site? Right? Mm-hmm. And I think, and mm-hmm. again, the other way of looking at it is how are we centering the humanity of our audience versus mm-hmm. centering mm-hmm. ourselves as, as journalists or content creators? Yeah, you know, one of the feedbacks that I get when I read or hear of, of certain stories, particularly when it's in the context of police violence, if you read a report or a really good story done on a victim of police violence with a family and they go, man, they really humanized them in that story. The fact that that is so rare that it elicits a response and it's worthy of note means that we've lost our way. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. We, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it is it's a huge disconnect just as a as a as a father, as a husband, as a black man in this city, mm. you know, there's, there's no secret that Philadelphia is dealing with epidemic gun violence, right? When I read stories and when I have read stories about the victims of gun violence, the most deflating feeling that I've had in reading stories around the issue of gun violence are the ones where I read stories where there's, there's no name, there's mm. no context, mm. it's just 22 year old black man shot dead in North Philadelphia, West Philadelphia, South Philadelphia. Um, No suspects have been apprehended. That's to me is not news. That doesn't convey Mm -hmm, anything mm -hmm. other than a sense of despair Mm -hmm. and that there is no solution to this problem. So it doesn't it doesn't give any information that I find um, necessary. And the sad part is that a lot of gun violence reporting and a lot Mm -hmm. of reporting about victims has is done in that kind of way. And I, I really love to see um, what can be done about it. And I love the fact that, you know, just to mention, uh, we've had Jim McMillan uh, mm-hmm. on as uh, one of our presenters as part of NICE, who started the- And tell our audience who he, who he is. Yeah, Jim McMillan uh, is the founder of the Institute for Better Gun Violence Reporting. 
Um, and he's done a lot of work around this issue from decades of experience as a journalist, but also understanding the victims of violence mm -hmm. and how the victims have responded to reporting or the lack of reporting. Um, and the impact of reporting on families ha have uh, been impacted by violence. And so uh, it's just, again, I'm glad to see that this is again an, a change in the direction of what journalism looks like as it relates to telling a human story. Hmm. Do you, did you, before joining WHOI, I know you said, you know, you didn't really involve yourself in journalism, but you are a well-read, well-studied guy. Did you spend time thinking about the future of journalism as a news consumer, or did that in that moment just seem beyond your, uh, beyond your, I don't want to say beyond your head, but like that's not your role. Your role is to consume the news, not to dictate or pontificate about its future. Well, well, first, let me just say thank you for those flowery <laughs> words, right? Um, but no, I've, I've thought about it in, in the way that I think the majority of the public thinks about it you have a feeling when you consume content. Mm. If you don't, that means you're already that zombie that institutions are looking for the eyeballs, right? That mm. we talked about earlier. So you, as a consumer of information, you have a reaction to that information. And I remember being a kid, I mean, literally a kid, single digits, eight, nine, maybe 10 years old, watching the news. And I'll never forget, I saw a story about a little black girl around the same age that I was at that time um, and how she had been the victim of some assault. And it impacted me as a child to the point where I remembered my feelings about the six o'clock news because that's where I watched it, right? Mm -hmm. And then as I've, as I've um, grown older, I recognized that the storytelling has changed when it comes to journalism and that as I gave you the example earlier, now we've gotten to the point where we start re reading about gun violence and there's no name, mm -hmm. there's no family association, there's no context. It's literally just an age, a race, a location, and whether the person was dead or not. Mm -hmm. And that is the dehumanizing thing that has happened in journalism over time. And so for me, I, I, one of the things I have to tell you know the audience about is, I told you this early on when I first got the job, was that it came at a very odd time for me personally in my life because I had gone on a diet of restricting and limiting the amount of news and information that I was consuming mm. because of the negative impacts of just reading those stories over and over and over again. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I've definitely thought about it. Definitely. Yeah. You know, I think I, I'm one of those guys. I, I never like to use the word nerd or blurred. I, I like to think of myself more as just say, um, uh, um, I have an insatiable appetite for information. Mm -hmm. I am always reading. Mm -hmm. I read on average about 40 news articles a day from at least 12 different news sources, ranging from the New York Times to the Guardian in the UK, to the Economist and the Financial Times. I just like to know what's going on. Also, I like to write. So to be a better writer, I like to read good writing. You know, mm -hmm. um, that's something I always think about. To that end, I, I used to always also find online different lectures and summits that were happening on the future of journalism. Mm -hmm. They were almost always moderated and included white men, older white men and white women. Very rarely did you see black men like you and I from the community talking about it. It was almost always about the emerging platforms, content delivery systems, mm -hmm. algorithms, distribution partnerships, syndication, content monetization, native ads, like all, all of these buzzwords, you almost never heard the word people. Yeah. You're an eyeballs, <laughs> you yes. hear people. And the other beyond that is that you never saw consumers as part of the conversation. Hmm. And I think about when, you know, we just, we just ran the um, Police Reimagined Future Public Safety one year later. And I think about that series. Hmm. When we were talking about redefining policing in this city, when we were, we were talking about rethinking public safety, we didn't get a panel of cops. Mm -hmm. We got a panel of people who experience policing, yeah. right? Who experience public safety. And I wonder like, how come that like, isn't just a native thought of when we're talking about the future of journalism, why aren't we including the people who are experiencing journalism and helping them to inform what that future is rather than simply it being the, the people who produce it. I think that goes to what you were talking about is that it's this elitist context that we know what's good for you and we're gonna feed it to you. And you better like it. 
I think what you just described is American history, mm -hmm. right? I think you've de 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 described what this country has been about for a very long time and where it's going, right? So when you talk about the future of journalism, you're actually talking about the future of America specifically mm. and the future of a global uh, family in a way, right? Because the, again, I go back to talking about the pandemic um, and I, I don't think it can be overstated in the fact that the pandemic showed us how we are one organism globally. Mm. Right. We, we, we're liter people literally passed the virus from one to another mm -hmm, to the mm -hmm. point where the United States saw over 500,000, almost 600,000 deaths. And interconnected lives, ecosystems. Inter yes. Interconnected lives globally. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about the change that we're seeing, you know, that perspective, that that very patriarchal, limited white male perspective um, is not a complete story of the community we're in. One of the things that I really, really appreciate about WHYY was WHYY did its own internal um, audit a mm -hmm. few years ago, and you're aware of this. And in doing that audit, some of the stats that came out was they saw that 80% of the newsroom was white, and 60% of that was white male. 80% of their sources were white male, right? Mm -hmm. But yet and still, we live in a city that can technically be considered a majority minority. Right. right. And so right. you're missing. How can you have an 80 percent white newsroom reporting on a city that's mm. as diverse and multicultural as Almost as it gets? This accurate. is one of the most diverse, diverse cities that can, that can be. I mean, it's a global city here. Exactly. And so how can you do that accurately if you're not actually having representation from all of those communities? And, mm. and, and not to say it's not possible. But how accurate is your storytelling if mm -hmm. your reporters aren't reflective of or don't have a cultural context of the communities that they're, that they're telling as well, of the stories, mm -hmm. that, the communities that they're telling stories in as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's another huge shift. Um, we're seeing a paradigm shift through all of this. Um, and, and, and again, it's, I think it's great. I think it's necessary. Um, and I think that it can only improve if we are mindful to, again, keep human storytelling at the center of what we do. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and wrapping up, I, I think as part of that paradigm shift, what I'd like to see also happen in thinking about the future of journalism being people from an organizing context is I don't think that we have created a context and a language for people for them to demand better journalism. Right. Think about it. When the school district does some mess, right? Like trying to put as windows in the fan, <laughs> as as prone to the do. Window, just prone to do. Or if the police department messes up and shoots a black man in the back while he's running away and kills him, or do two hundred thousand stop and frisk in a year, whatever the case may be, people know how to mobilize around that. They know how to message around that. They know how to create demands around that. But what do you do when you read coverage about your neighborhood and it's always centered on violence? What do you read when the, the information about your community is misinformation? What do you do when the news that you read or listen to isn't representative of your life, of your culture, of your race? I don't, you, when's the last time you've seen a protest in the streets of Philadelphia demanding better news coverage of X neighborhood? Mm. When have you ever seen a real mass mobilization of people in the streets about anything related to news, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it doesn't exist, right? And I think that's part of the disconnect is because I don't think we've created a context for which people can get involved in journalism because journalism feels like such a one-way thing. I write for you, you read and you pay me, right? But there's no two-way communication. You know, what's interesting about that observation, and I think you're right, um, but one of the things that I've learned through NICE and through dealing with the NICE partners is that the folks who do share those stories from a community perspective don't consider themselves journalists, right. even though they're performing acts of journalism, as you say. And I think that's important because when individuals make a distinction and they separate themselves from, again, this Ivy League you know, mm -hmm. model of what journalism is, I think it then shows that there's there is there is this this culture that exists. There is an opportunity for community members to participate, but they don't use the same language. They don't see mm. that 
o- overlap between the jour- the institution of journalism and the community content creators. Like they don't see that, but mm-hmm. one of the things that's great about NICE is that we're blending those two things in a way that I think is, is, is transformative for everybody involved. Mm-hmm. So it's it may not be the right language, like we don't have the language for it, but again, this goes back to the analogy that I use all the time about NICE. It's like, we're building the plane while we're flying it, right? <laughs> and so we're, we're venturing into new territory Mm. And that new territory is going to require new practices, a new language, mm-hmm. and a new way of understanding what we're doing and how we're doing it. And so it's just exciting to be part of it and to be on the cutting edge of it. And really happy that, uh, that, that one, that you guys have chosen me to be part of NICE and that we've gotten a chance to connect with the, the community contributors and the, the NICE partners who are creating content on their own mm-hmm. and helping shape that language. I guess my last question to you is, you know, and I, I, you, you kind of just alluded to it in terms of excitement, but I wonder if you could just give a little bit more color to like, what is it like for you? What do you feel going from six months ago to somebody who had cut, <laughs> cut out from the news media to being part of reshaping the news media as we know it in the fourth largest media market? Like that's a lot to happen. I don't know if you appreciate that, but that's a lot to happen in a very short time frame. Like, has that resonated with you? Has that sat with you? Have you really taken that in? Well, thanks for sharing that with me now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not until this moment, right? Okay. Um, no, I think it, it is exciting. I haven't really had a chance or didn't take, haven't really taken a, many moments to sit back and reflect mm-hmm. um, because, again, we're building this process. We're moving forward in ways that are, are new and innovative. Um, on occasion, I've sat back and thought about, you know, how transformative this last six to eight months has been Mm -hmm. right because we went through a long interview process to get here Mm -hmm. as well um so it the year itself i think um is one of transformation i don't think anybody has come out of 2020 without being impacted or transformed in some significant way and Mm. so for me where we are with nice at this moment um it's just a blessing Mm-hmm. considering all that we've had to overcome over the last you know, 365 days. So for me, this last six months has, has really been um, just an, an exciting um, roller coaster ride to be able to continue to build and connect the pieces together and continue to build this network and connect, mm-hmm. make relationships between individuals who thought that they were out here on their own um, and to see that kind of growth and um, the collaborations that are coming out of NICE, again, it's just, I can't tell you how rewarding it is and how inspiring it is for uh, mm-hmm. what I think about the future. Yeah, well, we're glad that you're on board, you know, and uh, I think, you know, the very cool thing about this is that this is literally just the beginning. And the fact that we're this hype, with this much interest and, and this much insight, and we're not even a year into this kind of process, you know, the long term ahead is is really amazing. And I'm absolutely looking forward to the future. So Eric, it's, it's been a pleasure and let's just keep the momentum going. Absolutely, Chris. I appreciate you so much. Thanks a lot. Yes, sir. <laughs>